Good morning. Welcome to Oak Bridge Community Church. How's everybody doing this morning? Awesome, awesome. Why don't you guys stand up with us as we get to worship and glorify our King.
Come sing it out. How great, 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 how great,
Thank you. You know, um, just amazing. I had goosebumps over the whole time. We serve an amazing God, and it's just brought to our attention just a few moments ago. You know, the officer uh, that was involved in the shooting not too long ago, he's really struggling right now with some health issues. So let's go to God right now. I mean, there are five, six hundred of us, and let's pray intensely for this man, and, and I'll lead us. Dear Father in heaven, we pray for Officer O'Connor. We pray right now for your healing touch. We pray for all of those who are involved in his recovery. We pray for the doctors. We pray for the nurses, for the staff, that you will give them wisdom, that you will allow the medication, the different things that he is on to take hold and, and to bring about recovery and healing. Father, we pray for his family right now. We pray for his wife, for his children, for those who are just related to him. God, that you bring him them comfort and peace in this difficult time. And we pray for the officer. We pray for Officer O'Connor, Father, that you just, if he's able to, to, to think clearly, if he is able to feel what's going on, God, that you bring him your comfort. But we are going to trust you in all this, and we know that there is nothing too difficult. And we ask for your mercy, for your grace, and for your healing in a way that is beyond our imagination. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys can go and take a seat. We are going to continue on. And uh, I had uh, several people come up to me after the first service and just say that they really enjoyed. We're going to have 10 minutes of extended prayer. And uh, if you're like me, I, I just struggle to pray. And sometimes I just struggle to even know what to pray about, even though I have my whole life to pray about. Sometimes I just don't even know words. So what helps me is that oftentimes I'll read scripture and I'll just pray that back. I'll meditate on that scripture and I'll just have a conversation with God about that. So I'm going to kind of guide you in a, in a little, you know, time of prayer here for the next 10 minutes or so. And uh, I want to read a passage from the book of Colossians. This is the Apostle Paul writing. He says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And you know, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, he says that we are to let our light shine. Let our light shine so that, that people will see our good deeds, not in some pompous way, not in some arrogant way, not in some showy way, but just the fruit of our lives so that people see that and they glorify our Father in heaven. Jesus says that he was the light of the world, but that his church is as well. So I know sometimes uh, we just struggle in some of these areas. So I, I want to just focus on kindness for a moment. I want you to think about your own life over these next couple minutes and, and reflect on your week. And just think of the encounters that you've had with your family, with your wife, with your husband, with your children, with neighbors, with your coworkers, with your boss, with fast food workers, with servers. Did you treat them with kindness? Would they have said, wow, that person brought something to my day that I didn't have before? And if you lack in that area, we've got a God of second, third, fourth, fifth chances. Ask him for forgiveness, but then ask him to help you to show this fruit, this, this kindness in your life. So go to God in prayer for a couple minutes now.
Dear God, we are, we are saved not by our works, but by your amazing grace. But you say that you do a work in us, that you're to transform us. So I pray, Father, that, that we all take this idea of, of, of clothing ourselves with kindness seriously. Father, that we realize that every single encounter that we have with other people might be the one that you use to lead them closer to you. So, Father, I ask for forgiveness for the times when I fall short, when I'm short with people, when I'm not gentle with people, when I am harsh, um, when I'm just not kind. And I pray for the same thing among these people, God. And I pray that you help us to rely upon your spirit moment by moment to bring about the change in us that we need uh, to impact the world. So, Father, help us to be kind. Help us to realize that, that, that your scriptures say that, that it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. Not your harshness, not your, not your, your, your justice, but, but, Father, this kindness aspect of you that leads us to repentance. And help us to mimic that in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. The next thing is patience. You know, and, and, and I heard a sermon a while back that talked about patience. Imagine you're traveling, uh, you know, you're going for a walk with a toddler. And just think of how they just kind of lollygag along and they're exploring everything and, and they're taking their time. Patience means you slow down to go at their pace. You know, you can't take a toddler and, and just kind of kick him along. I guess you could do that, but that wouldn't show patience, right? So when we're impatient, what we are is we're demanding that people get up to our speed. But Jesus was patient with people. He went about his day, slowed down so that he could actually minister to people and actually deal with people and talk with them. So think about your life. Have you shown patience this past week to your kids? to your spouse, again, to the people that you're around? Have you demanded that they, that they come up to you or have you slowed down? Have you showed that patience when you've been waiting in lines? Use the time just to connect with God. So take some time, think about that and think of the importance of patience in your life. Dear God, I know in my own life, when I am impatient, it's because the world is revolving around me in my own mind. That I'm thinking about all that I have to get done, that I'm thinking about all that I need to accomplish, and it's all about me, me, me. But Father, when we show patience, when I slow down to the, the pace of those around me, when I slow down to your pace where you say to be, to be still and know that you're God, Father, then things seem to be put into much better perspective. And I have time in my life for other people, for the relationships and the love that you call us to. So, Father, again, forgive us. Help us to, to move forward, to again rely upon you, to help us in this area, to bear this fruit in our lives. We thank you again in Jesus' name. And then finally, for the last one is to forgive one another. And this should be a no-brainer for Christians. We have been forgiven of everything by the amazing grace and mercy of our God that he doesn't hold our sin against us, and yet so often we struggle to forgive other image bearers, other, other strugglers, to, to forgive them of acts that they've committed against us. And, and I don't want to minimize those things. God is also a God of justice, but, but we need to leave that into God's hands. And I know some of us struggle with forgiveness, and you've got some things in your life that are just tough to forgive. I was talking with Josh last night, and he said he was watching the some a couple programs and he and he saw one i don't know if it was a news show or but he saw one where where a family a member of this one family had actually been murdered and in the courtroom these people were actually able to say that they were going to choose to forgive their son's murderer and he said then i saw another instance of a group of people that had been wounded deeply by this one man and 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 in the courtroom instead of instead of extending forgiveness they were just spewing out venom and, and he said, it was just sad because I knew that healing was going to come from the one subset of people. 
And then this other one, he knew that they were just going to be imprisoned by just this vengeance that they were wanting, by just this grudge that they were holding. So maybe you need to forgive someone, and maybe you're struggling with it, and I get that. But we've got a God that gives us his Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit, the same God that has forgiven us of everything. We can too, as we're followers of Jesus Christ, as we rely upon him. So go to God. Have him lay it on your heart. Maybe you're holding a grudge. Maybe you just don't know how to forgive. Maybe it's time for you to reach out and find some help, whatever that is. Talk to God about that. God, this idea of forgiveness we know is a big deal. You know, it's non-negotiable. You tell us to forgive as we've been forgiven. But Father, in this life, we experience a lot of hardships, a lot of pain, a lot of wounds that have been inflicted on us by other people. Father, help us to rely again upon you. We keep coming back to this. Father, uh, just give us your strength, give us your spirit, give us your guidance so that we can forgive, so that we can not demand payment from those who owe us. But, Father, instead, we release them of that burden. And as we do that, we know that we are released and we can live in freedom. Father, we thank you for this privilege that we have to come to you. And you tell us that we don't have because we don't ask. So I pray, God, that all of us will take this idea of prayer more seriously, that we start off every single day of our lives putting you first and and communing with you and fellowship with you and speaking with you. Because I know that when we do that, when we stay connected to you and we abide in you, our lives will bear much fruit. We ask all this in the mighty name of our King and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, Tom's going to come up in just a moment. Another great message in the series that I've liked a lot that, that helps us with wisdom. But before that, I've got a few announcements. And uh, one, if you're visiting with us today, we would love to get some information uh, into your hands. I'd love for you to stop by the information booth. You can pick up this little brochure. It tells you a little bit about our church, what's going on on Sundays, maybe throughout the week. There are a couple coupons in there that we use to bribe you to get this into your hands. Um, you can pick up a free beverage at the cafe with one of those, and you can go back to our bookstore and and get a free t-shirt for you and all those that are with you this morning. So I'd encourage you to do that. Also, a couple announcements specifically for you guys that, that maybe you're just checking this place out, visiting. We're, again, glad you're here. We won't take an offering during this service. So we want you to sit back, feel no pressure, relax. Uh, we hope that God connects with you, whether it's through songs, whether it's through prayer, um, whether it's through the message that's coming, uh, whether it's through just being around other people that are just wanting to grow and learn and acknowledge our King. So just sit back, enjoy the service. But if Oak Bridge is your home, we have the greatest mission in the world, and that is to bring the kingdom of God down to earth, to say, God, what you're doing up there, bring down to here. And we get to spread that and be the light in the world and, 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 and try and help uh, change this place for the better. So we would encourage you guys uh, to give generously if you believe in that mission. And then also we don't take communion during the service, but we have a room behind us called the Reflection Room, and I would encourage you at some point to go in there this morning. And, you know, there's a lot of people that have been to Oak Bridge several weeks, months, and I hear it from all the time, oh, I've never been back there. I, I'm going to give you a kick in the rear today, all right? Get, get back there and just, just check it out. And, again, what we just had those 10 minutes, you can experience in there of just throughout the morning of going in there, quieting down, remembering why we're here. And that's because we have a Savior that gave his own life, that died an excruciating death, that bore our sin on the cross, shed his blood, 
and, and, and his body was broken on our behalf. And you can remember that by taking the emblems um, back there. So a few announcements, a couple other announcements, just a few. One, Tom wanted me to mention... You know, we bought the Oak Bridge City Campus, and, and some of you guys want to jump in and start helping with that. Right now, we're having drawings drawn up, then it's going to go out to bid. Construction is going to start soon. Before you know it, we're going to be into that place. And you might be wondering how you can help, how you can get involved. Just uh, in the next few weeks, we're going to start having meetings, luncheons, you know, trips down there. So just keep your ears open, watch the website, show up here on Sundays, and more information uh, will be coming out on that. So uh, the edge to tonight. Um, this is it. Yeah, there we go. This is our second week back. A great. They did a, a series called Stranger Things. Me and my wife, Christy, a couple weeks ago, binged on that show, stayed up till like three in the morning one night. I think watched about 18 straight episodes. We're like zombies. But uh, again, they're kind of based in uh, this series on that. Josh gave a great message last week. He's going to give another one tonight that those services just encouraged me, warm my heart. So if you've never been to one um, and you're an adult and you think it's just for kids, I come up here. Come up here tonight, and you're going to be pleasantly surprised. And if you got middle schoolers and high schoolers, for sure get them up here. Uh, they won't regret it. And then also Married Life Live is coming up February 9th. You can get tickets online, oakbridgecc.com, or at the information table. Um, you could do that. And if you didn't join a community group and still want to get connected, go to the Connect Desk. They'll help you out with that. And before Tom comes up, I want to say another prayer. Again, God, we just thank you that you are an intimate God that you are a personal God, that you didn't create all this and then take off some weary out and who knows where. But, Father, you know the very details of our lives, and you want to be involved in those, and you want a relationship with each one of us. I thank you for the series that we're going through that's bringing great wisdom. I pray that these words that, that Tom speaks become not his but become yours to us and that we take heed and put these things into practice so that, again, we can let our light shine so that people will glorify you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Herc. Morning. How's everybody doing? You know, there are four words that generally follow a bad decision. What? was I thinking? Or what were you thinking? How many of you guys have ever said, what was I thinking? How many of you guys have ever said, what were you thinking to somebody? How many of you ever said it to the person sitting right next to you? <laughs> yeah, there are four things. If you go, what was I thinking? Well, we've, that's just common to all of us. What was I thinking? How could I have made that decision? Well, there's normally four key questions that can keep you from making that four-word statement, what was I thinking? There's four key questions, and that's where this series bore out of, that most of the people that I've ran into, when they've made bad decisions, it's not because they're bad people. It's not because they're stupid people. It's not because they're mean people. It's not because they're moral people. It's because they just don't set themselves up to make a good decision uh, by asking four key questions. And I think these four key questions run through the gamut of the Bible. In other words, the principle of the Bible. I think these are questions that almost all the leaders of the early church asked, and uh, I think the principles are solid, and every time I've asked these four key questions, it's made me make better decisions. Now, I just want to say, in all honesty, these four key questions may not make you make a perfect decision every time, because sometimes you make a decision with all the information you have, and stuff just goes a different direction. But I will tell you this, it will give you the greatest chance at success of making good decisions by a huge factor, a huge factor. And because of these four key questions, it's kept me from making some bad decisions, and it's caused me to make some super decisions, and it's the same thing for you as well. So week one, we talked about this first question, which it kind of runs through all this, and it's the toughest question because it's terrifying to ask. Because when you ask it, you've got to look inside yourself. You've got to really go a little bit deep, and that question was, am I being completely honest with myself, really, and why I'm doing this? Why I'm dating this guy why I went out on this car, why I went out with this, this uh, girl, uh, why I responded that way to my mom. Am I being completely honest with myself, really? What was the reason? Sometimes we've lowered our values. Sometimes we've raised our values because of that question. But you need to ask that one to get past the surface a little bit. And that can be terrifying, but it's freeing. So I'd encourage all of you to start off with that question with any decision. Okay, am I being completely honest with myself? Or are we being completely honest with ourselves? In Jeremiah 17, 9, this prophet writes this, which it's, was written thousands of years ago. It's ancient writing, but it's just as true uh, today as it was back then. And here's what he wrote in Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. 
Who can understand it? And that statement means we're the best liars to ourselves. We can talk ourselves into anything, right? You get a little dent on your uh, oven. Well, we probably need a new oven now. It's not that the oven doesn't work, but you can say, well, I don't want it with a dent. And by the way, if we have somebody come out and fix it, it's probably going to cost 80 bucks anyway. We might as well buy a what? New oven. I mean, you can talk yourself into anything, and we do that. We do that over and over again. So you have to be very careful about your heart. And what's even crazier about this is it says it's beyond cure. So it's going to always be an issue that your heart wants to talk you into doing things. So you can't really trust it all the time. You say, well, I just feel, I know, but that's kind of danger. Why are you really doing this, really? Well, the question in week two was, last week was a great one. What story do I want to tell? And I tried to make an, a, 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 a statement that you hold the pen. You write in the story of your day. You can say, well, I don't know what my life's going to be like, but you know what today's going to be like. What story do you want to tell today? When this situation comes up, what story do you want to tell? Good or bad, you're writing it. You're the author. You can do this. So the second question would be, what story do I want to tell? I, being honest with myself, really, what story do I want to tell? And we looked at Psalm 90:12, which is the oldest psalm written. And it was written by Moses. And here's what he wrote about that, Psalm 90:12: Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. In other words, teach us to understand what story you want to tell. Teach us to know in this day, what are we saying about our lives? And if you can learn to ask that question at a young age or an old age, those two they're really solid questions that can get you on the uh, path to making a great decision. Well, today's is the third question, a great question, one I think we've all wrestled with. I'm just going to try and put legs to it and show you that, you know, what you probably already know, but I think it'll bring it to life a little bit. But to illustrate the third question, I'm going to show you guys something. I'm going to blow this balloon up. Now, this is, a, uh, this is an automatic balloon blower. It's pretty powerful. I tested this last night. And the first three balloons I blew up, I couldn't stop this thing from blowing up. The tension got too big, and it blew up. And it sounded like a shotgun. So I want the people to know outside, if there's any policemen in here, there's no gun going off. This may be this, be this balloon. But as I look around, I see a couple babies in here. So I'm going to try and not have this thing blow up. I don't want to hear your baby cry. You don't have your baby cry. I don't want you mad at me. But I'm going to try and blow this up as much as I can without popping it. You guys ready? Now, this is pretty tight, the tension on this balloon. I couldn't have gotten much more in there. When you guys blow up a balloon, do you pay attention to the tension? You do, don't you? All right. That's the question. Am I paying attention to the tension in a decision? There will always be some tension in a, in a decision. Or I'll say it this way. Is there a tension in this decision that needs my attention? Do I need to pay attention to this tension? So here's what I'm saying. The tension normally is a subtle moral or ethical dilemma. The tension is normally a subtle moral or ethical dilemma. It's not like, should I go to work today or should I rob a bank? It's not like that. It's normally much smaller. It's more, it's more like this. Should I go to work? And when I go to work, should I co-sign on that document for my work? Now, your work might be doing something a little. So you've got this dilemma. Well, it's not me doing it, but if I sign this document, it's just a tension. It's just a tension. I'll give you a story about that tension when I didn't pay attention to the tension. We had some stores, chain of stores, and I was an owner president of it. And it was at Northwest Plaza. You guys remember Northwest Plaza Mall? Yep. We had a store there, and they were just remodeling this mall. And so we had a great location right on the corner of the food court. I knew it was going to be a high-volume store. So uh, the guy, the leasing agent brings the lease in, and they said, we want to sign you a 10-year lease. And I said, that's good. I'll sign a 10-year lease. And so I signed, and he says, but we also need a personal guarantee from you. Now, I'm sitting here thinking, well, a personal guarantee from me, as well as me signing for the company, it should be, it's no big deal because I control the company. So if anything ever goes wrong, I'll just have the company pay off this lease, and I'll be fine. But I knew there was a tension about me co-signing for something that ultimately it wasn't me doing it. It was the company doing it. So you should have an idea of where this is going. About eight years after I signed this lease, the company went under. 
we had to close all the stores. This is one of the stores that we had to close. And uh, so come in, close it. All of a sudden, I get a phone call about a year later. And it was from that leasing company. And they said, uh, we wanted you to know that you owe two years still on your lease. And I said, well, you know, that's just tough. You can't do anything about it. The business went under. I'd forgotten that I'd signed a personal guarantee for that. And the guy says, uh, well, I will tell you this. There is something we can do about it. We could sue you and bring you to court. And I said, well, how much money is the monetary judgment potentially? How many years do we owe on that lease? And he says, approximately $225,000. Now, I didn't have anywhere near that money, not even close. So I ended up settling out of it and I had to pay $25,000. Now, that was a big chunk of money then, big chunk of money now. Do you think I should have paid attention to the tension? I blew it off. I mean, it was there. It cost, it cost me 25 grand. Now, can I even say this? By me not paying attention to the tension, not only it cost me 25,000, it cost my wife 25,000. It cost my daughter, Katie, $25,000. Dad, you can't pay for my whole schooling? Nope. Why? I didn't pay attention to the... Now, that's not the conversation, but that was part of the the residual effects of not paying attention to the tension. Uh, the tension, normally in a decision, is generally a, just a little red flag. A little red flag comes up. Should I do this? Should I go out with them? Should I, should I talk about this? A little red flag comes up. Or it doesn't uh, feel totally right. You ever had that feeling where it just, just doesn't feel totally right? Or there's just something in your gut that, you know, this just doesn't sit well with me or a little hitch, or a little bump in the road for the Christian. Here's what we used to call it, kind of older Christians. It's a check in your spirit. You just know, man, there's just something that it doesn't make sense looking at this, and, and you're trying to reason it all away, but there's just something that you just know that something's not right. Something may be rotten in Denmark. And it's just a small little moral thing. It's a small little ethical thing. It's just a small little red flag. The tension, why you want to blow it off and get rid of it is because of this. That tension normally affects four Ps that all of us care about. Here's the four Ps. Pleasure, passion, profit, or promotion. In other words, when you, when you have this little check in the spirit, when you have this little red flag that comes up, normally you want to try and not deal with it because you want to dismiss it because it normally affects one of those things. Pleasure, passion in the moment, profit, something you can make, or promotion. See, I was thinking the whole time, well, if I, sign, if I don't give my personal guarantee, they may not give me that location. They may not. So I thought, you know what? That would affect what? Profit. It's, it's a way to build, uh, to promote our company. So I, I blew it off thinking that. Now, I wish, honestly... I wish I would have uh, thought about that a little bit more. So I'll give you some examples of this. A friend says to you, well, do you remember what happened last time when you did that? When you said that? And you know, you feel it. You feel it. I mean, you just know there's something there. You feel it. And you just you, you want to dismiss it. Because you know, well, I'm going to have a good time if I, well, there's money to be made if I do well, if I, if, I, if I say this, but there's just this little check. Or somebody says to you, well, didn't you sign up to work that night? What do you mean saying you can go there? Didn't you give your word? And there's just a little check in the spirit. There's just a little thing. Well, didn't you say you're going to do that? And you're not going to do it now? Didn't you say you're going to do that? And here's our responses. Anytime we get that little uh, tension, here's what we respond. It's no big it's no big deal. It's just, it's no big deal. Or how about this one? Well, everybody does it. You ever told one of your teens? Well, have you thought about it? I mean, here's what could happen. Quit worrying about it. It's no big deal. Everybody what? Everybody does it. I mean, you did it when you were 15 too, didn't you? Or how about this one? Well, do you know how they treated me? I mean, you know how my work's treating me? Yeah, I said I'd work till on that day. No, do you know how they're treating me? So we justify it. Or this one, I love this one. Oh, that's just so old-fashioned. 
I know people used to do that, but that's not anymore. That's just old-fashioned. Or this one. It's only this one time. Just one time. It's no big deal. Or how about, I love this one. This is the famous one. We, we, we to the tension. Nobody will know. Nobody will know. Nobody will know. It's in the privacy of my own room. Nobody will know. There's no way this will ever get out. It's just on my phone. I'm just going to text it this. Nobody will know. Should you really be sending that? Nobody will know. I can never find out. Here's a question. When you're making a decision, this is what I'm going to ask you to do. And this is where I'm going to move into the, the heart of this message. And a little red flag of tension comes up. Just a little red flag. It's just a little bitty, you know, cloud in the sky. And, and you know it's there. Would you let it get as big as it can? Would you not just blow it off? Would you not just use one of the statements that I said everybody does and it's no big deal? Would you let it get as big as it can? Pause for a moment or two and refuse to ignore that tension. Pay attention to that tension. Let it stew in your mind for a time period, just a little while. Don't blow it off right away. Don't blow it off. And here's why I'm telling you to do this. I could march people up on stage. I could say this myself without even bringing any people up to church on the stage. But how many people would love to be able to go back and thought about uh, how they closed their eyes to something? And they wish they wouldn't have closed their eyes to that. They wish they would have known, well, he only got violence once. They closed their eyes to it. How many like to go back and say, you know what? I lowered my standards. It's no big deal. They'd like to go back because they didn't pay attention to that tension. Or they signed that contract. Or they got in the car. Or they drank that night. Or they joined in on gossip. They said something. They said, They'll never, it'll never get back to them. And you felt bad before you were going to say it, but you said it anyway. You know what happened with that. Paying attention to the tension is a great question. I've, if you've been in this series for the last couple of weeks, I've gotten a lot of input from people saying it's helping them make decisions. But I, I, I thought if I could bring my friend up on stage who I kind of started with this series about, I just wanted to remind you, he's a great guy. Morally good, sweet guy, smart, uh, and yet he did some really dumb things. In fact, I, I've said this before. He's such a good guy. He's younger than I am. I would be proud to have my son. So you don't have to be a, a, a bad person, a stupid person, a, a, an uninformed person to sometimes make decisions that you say, what was I thinking? And that had big consequences to it. So my friend, if I brought him up on stage and said, well, you went on this weekend with this gal that you met in a dark bar and you were tipsy. And you went on a weekend away with her, with her family, for four days. You had to ask the question, if he was here, didn't you feel like, is this, there's got to be some tension about going away for a four-day weekend with a gal that you met in a dark bar when you were kind of drunk on one night. There has to be some, he had to at least check, have a check in his spirit somewhere that said, uh, is this smart to go do this right now? I don't think, I think there was, but I think he blew it off. The minute he stepped off the plane and saw her, he wishes he wouldn't have blown off that tension. It was a bad day for him, a bad weekend for him. Wasn't there a tension when the girlfriend that you're dating, that you married, that you hooked up with her best friend? Wasn't there a tension? I mean, maybe you blew it off by saying it's only once, nobody will know. But wasn't there a tension somewhere about this is not right, this is not going to end well, this is not a good thing, even if nobody finds out? Wasn't there a tension? And I think there was. And I think he... I think he blew it off. Oh, everybody's doing it. I don't know what he said, but there had to be that because he's smart. He's a good guy. Well, wasn't there a tension when you had a job and it was a great job and you manipulated a sheet of paper and by manipulating that sheet of paper, you personally benefited from it, but it created a sense where now you're a felon and you're going to go to jail? I mean, wasn't there a sense at time where, where this was wrong, signing this, doing this, changing this on this piece of paper? I think there was. He just didn't pay attention to the tension. Listen, all of you listen to me. I love you. 
This is a big question. There's a big question. And if you hang with me on this, if you hang with me on this, I think you're going to find that there's a big God behind this tension for many of us in what we do. Was there a tension that needed his attention? Go back to another story. So that was my friend. We've been talking about this, this David. A lot of you know about David, David and Goliath, the giant. But in this situation, he's, he's already slew uh, Goliath, and he's grown in popularity. And there's this king of Israel named Saul, King Saul. And uh, King Saul's kind of an egomaniac. He's paranoid. Uh, he believes that David is trying to take away his throne. And so what he does is he says, we're going to go after David. So David had a bunch of men. They had to uh, were running away in, in the desert where their caves are at. And King Saul comes after him. And he chases him down. And I'm going to pick up this story to tell you what happens. So imagine this. Saul's men, 3,000 men, are coming after David and his men. David's men are scattered throughout caves. There's a bunch of caves. All of a sudden, King Saul has to use the restroom. He has to go to the bathroom. So like a king, I guess at that time period, they didn't do it out in front of everybody. They didn't go behind a tree. I guess he went in a cave. He disrobes, it says, in this cave. And it just so happens in this cave that he goes in to use the bathroom in the most vulnerable position he could ever be in, right? He comes in, he walks into this room, and that's where David and some of his men are hiding. Now, you've got to look at this, and you've got to say to yourself, this has got to be God. This has to be God. This has to be of the making of God. There's no question about it. I mean, the situation is too good. We've asked that question before, haven't we? A met a person, had a job offered, uh, said we were going to move, where we just said, this is just too good. This has got to be God <clears throat> putting everything together. So is this situation. Saul comes walking in, disrobes. He's vulnerable. The people are with him, they go, hey, David, this is it, man. You, you, you take care of him. You walk out. I said, all the people, this has to be God. What are the odds of this? So we pick up and read. The Bible is incredible. This ancient history, if you've never read it, it is, even if you don't believe it was inspired by God, it is great wisdom, great teaching, amazing history. So we have this ancient document recorded called 1 Samuel, chapter 24, 4 through 7. We pick up. We're all in the cave. Saul comes in. His men are saying, this is it. You can go kill him. This is set up. It's, it's right there on a platter for you. The men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, David, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Pause, look at me. This is it. It's on a platter. This is a single deal. Here's the knife. Go do your business. Walk out of here. We won't be challenged anymore. You haven't, you haven't done anything to the king. You've been good. You support him. Somewhere as David's crawling with his knife, moving towards Saul. Somewhere he paid attention to the tension. Somewhere he paid attention to the tension. Let's see. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off Saul's head. No. And cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Yes. Now, wait a second. All the men had just said, this is set up. This is a set up. God brought him here for you. No question about it. And he goes up and he cuts off a corner of his robe, crawls back, comes back to the men. Afterward, David was conscious stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. And I think for thinking about what he was going to do as he's crawling. But somewhere in that midst of that crawling, that 100 feet, that 50 feet, that 30 feet, whatever it was, he paid attention to the tension that was in him. And then here's what he said to his men. The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master. Read it. The who? Read it out loud. The who? The Lord's anointed. Wait a second. The Lord made King Saul the first king of Israel. And David knew it. He said, as I'm crawling up, should I be the one to come in and kill the king who the Lord put in place? Should I be that one or lay my hand on him? For he is anointed of the Lord, he tells his men. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. So get this picture. They said, you were afraid to do it, we'll do it. He says, if you've forgotten one little tension, God put him in place. If you've forgotten one little tension, 
God gave you that mom. Have you forgotten one little tension? You're supposed to be kind, even when people are unkind. Have you forgotten this little attention? God sets barriers, standards for us, not to oppose us, not to hurt us, but to lift us up and set us free. He said, have you forgot the attention? That I meant to replace a person that God put in place? Amazing, isn't it? And Saul left the cave, it says, and he went on his way. Well, I just want to ask you a couple questions. If he didn't pay attention to that tension as he was crawling, I have no doubt he was going for the attention of, of taking Saul out physically of this world. Just a question. If he killed Saul, what guarantee was it that he was going to become king of Israel? Absolutely what? None. Now, hold on. What guarantee was it if he killed Saul that he would be either selected by God or or selected by people or both king of Israel? There was no guarantee. You know what the guarantee was? He'd be known as the murderer of Saul. That was the guarantee. But you know, we're in the middle of a moment because of those four Ps, pleasure, profit, passion. You sometimes just don't think clearly and you don't pay attention to that tension. You blow it off. We don't pay attention. Get this. Listen to this. We don't pay attention to the tension because we try and determine the outcome ourselves. We believe we can control outcomes. Look at me. You cannot. You can't control outcomes. And sometimes we avoid something that's a red flag that we know we should get, let get bigger because we're trying to control that outcome. Well, I knew he or she was selfish, but that, that'll never impact me. Well, if I went to the party, I didn't think that was ever going to happen. Yeah, I know. You knew the tension. You didn't think about it. But that car accident did happen. That sexual assault, which you didn't cause, but you could have if some other things weren't put in place. And you knew the tension. See, it's a big deal because there's a God who's big and loves us. And sometimes this tension, I think, is put there uh, for our behalf. Back to David. Back to David. He paid attention to the tension, and he trusted God for the outcome. See, this is where he pulls way ahead of me and a lot of us. You can understand the tension, but he did something that I think is Christians. Now, if you're not a Christian right now, you don't have to even zone in on this. But if you're a Christian, he did something that was amazing. He trusted God with the outcome of the situation. Listen to what he says when he walks out of the cave. Amazing, he did this. Saul walks out, probably doesn't even notice after he puts his robe back on that the corner of it's missing. He walks out to all of his men. David comes walking out a little while later. Saul, hello, Saul, Saul sees him. And here's what is recorded that David said in 1 Samuel 24, 12. May the Lord judge between you and me, Saul, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs that you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. So see, sometimes things that look like they're 100% set up by God, they're not. They're not. Saul, I mean, David pulls ahead of a lot of us. I think when we try and control the outcome and we don't often pay attention to the tension, here's what God says. Well, I've tried warning you. I think he says this to us, and you may not hear it. I've tried warning you. I brought a friend to you. The friend said, well, how about this? You didn't pay attention to that. Your mom and your dad said this, and you didn't pay attention to it. There was even this one day where I brought you to this church, and this extremely good-looking guy in a brown sweater, he tried telling you this. And you, you didn't pay attention to that. I think God at times, when he says, you want to control the outcome? You think you want to manipulate it? 
Have at it. I've given you freedom. David, you want to kill him? It's no guarantee you're going to become king, but it is a guarantee you're going to become a murderer. You want to lie? It's not, it's not a guarantee you're going to get the result you want, but you will become a liar. See, I don't think God loves you less. I just think he says, I'm trying to give you some tension that if you pay attention to it, it may change your decision. It might not. You blow it up and you might end up making the same decision. Next week we're going to talk about how next week's question impacts this week's question. You need to pay attention to the tension, people. Seven chapters later, unbelievable. 1 Samuel 24, 1 Samuel 31. Seven chapters later, there's a battle. And uh, King Saul is in the battle. And the enemy's shooting arrows randomly. Hordes of arrows coming in. And the king's fully armored. And one of the arrows, perchance, as it would happen, misses the armor and wounds King Saul to the point where he knows he's going to die. He ends up taking his own life. So by chance, a random arrow falls, and it takes King Saul out of the picture just seven chapters later, and guess who becomes king of Israel? David. David becomes king of Israel. Well, you know what? I could imagine David just speaking to God. Well, you, if you just would have told me that seven chapters later I'd be the king, I wouldn't even considered cutting off his head or his robe. God, if you just would have told me that. And God says, I'm faithful without telling you anything. And I'm trustworthy without you knowing the, the final chapter. And I'm writing the story for you that is greater than anyone that you can ever write as you put your hands in my hands. Now, that's amazing, isn't it? How many times, well, God, if you just would have told me, I wouldn't have gotten in the car. Well, if you would have told me, I wouldn't have gotten behind that door. If you would have told me, I wouldn't have drank that. And God says, I brought attention to so many questions. Even if I had told you, you wouldn't have listened verbally. It's so neat uh, when we put it in the hands of God. I want to just say this. This is just huge. If, if you've not listened to anything else, just come back to me again here. Here's a big point that I've always found. You lose the confidence of God's presence when you try and control the outcome. Can I say it this way? In other words, when you leave it in God's hands, God, I'm sick. I got a diagnosis of cancer. I'm going to put it in your hands. I'm going to go get this checked. And even if the report comes back bad, what I found is when you put it in God's hands when you trust him, you have a peace that surpasses all understanding. That even if it's not an easy road, it becomes the best road, that there's hope. When you, don't, when you manipulate the circumstances, when you try not to pay attention to things, then you feel the full weight of that. See, I think our responsibility is to trust and follow God and leave the results to him. And you know what? Listen, listen, please listen. The results are normally phenomenal. They're what you want anyway. There's more joy. There's more hope. There's more love. There's more kindness. There's more generosity. There's more self-control. And I know it seems hard, but that's where God says, that's the faith I'm looking for. That's the faith that pleases me. That's the faith that I reward. By losing confidence of God's presence when we try and control the outcome. I'm going to close with a story that you kind of heard a little bit about paying attention to attention. A year ago, about this time, we were in negotiations for a church in Oak Bridge and Festus. Now, I want to let you know if you live in that area down further, we've not done thinking about that. My goal, I think I got about another 10 good years. Maybe. My goal is to try and add 10 more churches in the St. Louis area. City, county, Jefferson County, wherever God leads. That's my goal. Not uh, for ego. You know, what's the real reason I'm doing this? Nothing to do with me, but because we've shown a tendency that we can create environments where people come to know Jesus, where they grow in, in the love for Christ. We've seen people before that have been church people all along. They go, I tell you what I'm experiencing now is totally different than my 30 years of a religion. We've seen new people that have been hardened that said, I would never trust Christ. I've seen people come from other countries. 
that have come to churches here and they had no idea of who Jesus was. And when the, the lights put on him a little bit more, they get it. It wasn't that complicated. How we miss it. So I think God's given us the burden, a good burden. I think he's given us the responsibility, a good responsibility, to be part of the decision to help make disciples of all the nations by building these gatherings of people called these churches. So I thought, you know what? Uh, we got a lot of people from down south. Oak Ridge Festus would probably be a, a good place to start. How many of you guys are, are from uh, Imperial Down? Raise your hand. Yeah, so, you know, there's a lot of people from them in that way, and I thought this would be good. So I went through the whole deal, and without going through the whole long story, it became about a $3.5 million deal. And the realtor comes back and says, I want another five grand. I didn't think it was fair. I didn't think it was right. There was a tension that got my attention in this negotiation. So I go to Herc and I said, they want $5,000 more on a $3.5 million deal. Now you got to understand, listen to this, this won't make sense to you unless you understand this. The math is the same. If you went and got a $35 blouse, you had a blouse for $35, and you went away, you said, I'll be back in a half hour, and you came back, and the salesperson said, it's $35.05 now. It would not make sense for you not to pay that extra nickel. That's what this was, mathematically the same, a nickel. But I told Herc, I said, hey, Herc, I got a question for you. If they wanted another $500,000, because we're spending the money that God's people have generously brought back to God, and that's the responsibility that, that we have as leaders. I said, if there's another 500000 would we do it? Herc goes, no, we definitely wouldn't do it. It's ridiculous. Well, what, Herc, what if it's another $250,000? No, we wouldn't do it. 100000 no, we wouldn't do it. And I said, what if it's 50000 He said, no, we wouldn't do it. He said, Tom, the principle's the same. If it's not right for them to charge that, and if we believe we couldn't stand before people and before God and answer to that, then we shouldn't do it. And I said, Herc, what... What if it's $5,000? Not for $5,000. I said, Herc, what if it's 50 cents? He said, not for 50 cents. Send back, this is the fair deal, this is what it is. Well, their realtor came back and said, we're not going to accept it then. We paid attention to the attention. We made it as big as we could. And now I'm going to trust God that in his own due time, we'll be going down to Festus. Now, you know what I'm praying? I'm praying that one of you has 35 acres. <laughs> and there's a $5 million building that you want to see built. And it won't be Oak Bridge Festus. It'll be Oak Bridge your name if you choose to give all that. <laughs> Says, so, okay, God, this doesn't make sense. I'm almost ashamed of telling my congregation this because it seems so insignificant. And here we are one year later and we own Oak Bridge City. That would have never happened. A property that's not $3.5 million, a property that's going to be $2 million. A place where our city needs help I couldn't have controlled this outcome. I couldn't have manipulated this outcome. I could have said, fine, we're going to do this anyway. But I paid attention, attention. We let it get big. And then I brought it to all the leaders. And all the leaders said the same thing. Now, you can call us nuts over a $3.5 million project, over five grand, which is a nickel. Or you can say, I tell you what, Tom, there's times where I wish I would have paid attention, attention. And trusted God for the result. And trusted that he's good. And he's wise, and he loves me, and he loves you. And even together, if you're with a couple, start asking these questions together. It makes a huge difference. See, I, I can talk now about, with you honestly, about how we're trying to grow churches. And you can know that I'm going to pay attention if there's that little red flag. And it should make you feel good. And I want that for you in all your relationships. Man, I want for you that at work. And if you're young, boy, there's an evil one that's going to just try and make you blow off so many red flags, so many gut checks, so many, the spirit just doesn't feel right. You can make good decisions. God wants us to make great decisions by asking some great questions.
Am I paying attention to the tension? That's one of them. Father, we just come to you. And we just thank you. And Father, I want to pray for the person that's in this room. That beyond a shadow of a doubt, there's been a tension in whatever they're trying to make decisions about. I, Father, I pray that you give them courage and wisdom, not a spirit of timidity or fear, that they can bring that tension up and they can talk about it. And maybe that tension won't prevent the decision, but at least they'll know that they made the decision clearly. Father, I thank you that you're the kind of God that does that. Father, I thank you that you've told us you'll give us wisdom as we pursue your son and pursue the wisdom of your scripture. God, I thank you that you're our rock. You're our cornerstone. I thank you that when we make bad decisions, you don't love us any less. I think you just hurt for us more. God, I thank you that you're a good father. I thank you that Jesus was a great teacher. I thank you that he paid attention to the tension that was in his life, to the times where he was tempted but did not give in. God, I pray that you can make us as followers of your son wiser than what we have a right to be. God, I love you and I know that you love us. Help us to continue to make decisions that put us on a better course in life with you and through you. God, hear our prayers now. Hear this song as we sing it as an anthem to you. May these last few moments be holy as you guide us. It's in your son's name I pray. All God's people said, amen. Would you please stand and sing with me to our King? Trust. 
before I close, could you guys just give these guys a round of applause? So much talent here to bring us towards the throne of Jesus. Thank you, guys. Hey, if I blew up a balloon, what would you pay attention to? The tension. We, a little balloon, we pay clo- close to attention to the tension. Isn't it so cool that there's a God who's just like, just dropping hints? that I'm here with you. I mean, you got the freedom. But I, it's, it's a sign of the reality of God because all of us have experienced something like that. Whether you're a Christian or not, you've had something that you just know this is a red flag. More is going on here. You know, the good news is there's a God that loves us. He's trustworthy. There's a statement that says, is is God dangerous? He's dangerous in a very powerful, good way. Because what he offers is all the time not safety, but he offers truth and an adventure and hope and passion and a solid ground to land on. I just hope you come back next week because I know all of you should, you should be walking out with this question. Well, Tom, almost every decision has some little tensions to it. How do I know to pay attention to those or not? We talked a little, about it a little bit today, but when you come next week, we'll kind of put the bow on it. The series been good for you guys? All right, see you next week. Thanks for coming. Oh, if you, we have these little rubber bands out front, an expensive gift. If you want one of these to remind you guys' attention, they're out front at the Information Center. There you go.